probability. That's the topic, right? So for some of us, ooh, when we think probability, you might think about gaming. Oh, someone said craps, right? That's a, that's a, a gambling game, not just gaming, that's a gambling game. I mean, maybe I'm thinking about Monopoly. Oh. <laughs> maybe not, right? Maybe I'm thinking about cards. Maybe not. But in any event, I am thinking about possibly something occurs, possibly it doesn't. You know, when you have a, a little kid and you want to start talking about ideas of probability, there's been a big push to teach probability at the elementary school level. Why? Because more and more people need statistics. And probability is very intertwined with statistics. There's this little marriage of the two subjects of mathematics. What you tell a little kid is you say, hey, is this more likely to happen or less likely to happen? Which of the two is more likely? That's the very first concept you want to get an idea is that some events are more likely to occur than others. And notice I use the word event. That's a fancy math word. But I want to get you more comfortable with it today. What I mean by an event in the world of probability. You guys, when we talk about probability, there's basically three different approaches that are going to be used in the book. The first words you're familiar with, right? In the green there. What does that mean? Relative frequency. You're going to have a percentage chart, okay? We could talk about the relative frequency of any frequency distribution, right? Some things are more likely to occur than others. You might remember when we talked about IQ scores, we said that they follow a blank distribution. What's the blank? Normal, Normal distribution. And what does that mean? The bell curve, right? And that says that IQ scores in the middle are more likely to occur than IQ scores at either end. Right? More likely, less likely. That's the first idea behind probability. And then you'll notice the next line there I wrote down classical probability. That's what I'm going to spend the most time on. Because I'm a mathematician, guys. It's what I can share with you. The third way that people talk about probability is what's called subjective. I remember getting very upset when I learned more about subjective probability. Because the whole time I was growing up, I would hear, the chance of rain today is, and they would say, 70%. And I remember wanting to know the formula they used. How'd they get 70%? That's not what happens. When a, when a weatherman says, hey, the chance of rain is 70%, he's trying to tell you it's more likely it's going to rain than it is on other days. You've got to bring your umbrella. If the weatherman says, oh, 20% chance of rain, it's probably not going to rain. It could, but probably not. You guys understand? That's subjective. It's, it's a way of communicating language. Whereas classical probability really talks about this kind of, these are the symbols we're going to use today. P stands for probability. A, B, or C, capital letters like that, are going to be what are called events. And so we will write, the way you read that P parentheses A, we will read that probability of A occurring. I want to write some of that down, and I want to try and make some sense of it for you, so we have some examples here. Uh, so let's see. Um, yeah, let me give you... As we do this intro to probability, let me give you the main formula. I want to zoom in. I'm about to do another one, and so I'll tell you, A and B, or any capital letter, is called an event. 
So when I write this, P of, I'm going to use E to help you remember what it is. Instead of using A or B, let's use capital E. E is an event. E is an event. And I have to give you an example or you don't know what an event is. So let's roll a die. Here. Ah, a five. I'm going to pick it up and roll it again. Do you think I'm going to roll a five? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says maybe? Oh, yeah? There, isn't there a chance I'll roll a five again? Oh. What if I flip it over? No, no. All right. Here. The probability of an event occurring, and the event might be rolling a five is equal to, and what we're going to write, I'm going to write it this way. Now, n has usually meant sample size, right? But here, the way I'm going to say this is I'm going to say the size of the event over the size of the sample space. It's funny because we've talked about samples, but here's a word that I need to define. Sample space. What do I mean by that? S, the sample space, This is the set of all possibilities. The set of all possibilities. And then I want to give you a warning, so I better pull out my pink marker. Here we go. Warning. Warning. This formula only works if all possibilities are, let me switch to this, equally likely. To occur. And I think that's an idea that we have to get across here. This, this, you know, doesn't always happen. I want to play a little game with you today. I brought in not only dice, but thumbtacks. Oh, you can't really see that. Let's zoom out a little bit. You can see a few of them. Here we go. So you roll the thumbtacks on your paper, that's how you play. See how many I have? I have eight, okay? I have eight thumbtacks. And I guess for each thumbtack there's two possibilities, up or down. So basically, the way this game works is Yeah, it's how they fall. So it's either up, down, or on the side. Well, okay. So I'm going to say that down, the way you're talking about it, is impossible. Because I've never rolled the thumbtacks out of the cup and gotten it to point straight down like that. I mean, it would have to, like, stick into the paper, right? So, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say up, don't sit on it. Don't sit on it, right? You get hurt. Anything else I'm going to call down. So you can call it sideways if you want. But I'm going to call that down. You guys with me? No? Ashley? So as I look at this one, you guys tell me, is this one up or down? Yeah, don't sit on that one. How about this one? How about that one? 
It's down, because look, if I kind of push it around a little bit, that one's up, be careful. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I rolled the thumb to, how many do I have up? Oh, I have four that are up, right? So one roll of eight tacks, I got four that were up. Did that surprise anybody or not? No? Would it have surprised you if I rolled them and all eight were up? Would it surprise you if I rolled them and all eight were down? Maybe you've never played this game, so maybe you wouldn't be surprised by anything, right? Okay. I guess what I'd like to do is I'd like to play lots of times. And the reason I want to play lots of times is I'm trying to help you understand a few statistics ideas, probability ideas, actually. Kind of both. And the idea I want to get at when we're talking about classical probability is called the law of large numbers. And so I'd like to explain that now. But I'd also like to play the game, let everyone play. So we're going to start here in the back with Randy. I want you to make a roll, record how many are up of the eight. Try not to lose them. And uh, pass, it on, pass on the cup to the next play. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a data set this way of playing lots of times. We may have to talk about the results uh, next time because this is going to take me to the end here. But basically, the law of large numbers says the following. If an experiment is repeated many times, the relative frequencies, what are those? Yeah, so for example, what percentage of the tax when I threw it were up? 50%, right? The relative frequencies will, I'm going to say, approach. What does approach mean? I don't know. Get close to. Will approach the classical probability. What do I mean by classical probability? I think I showed you the formula. Uh, I think I have it right up above. Let me write it for you. Yeah. Yeah, zoom out. It's going to approach this fraction, right? The size of the event over the size of the sample space. So what should happen? What should happen? Yeah. Hey, guys, when I roll a die, what's the probability of rolling a five, we said? There you go. Okay. Probability of rolling a five. is one out of six. Now that's my third roll, and I've only got one five so far. There's another roll. There's another roll. There's a six. I've rolled six times and I got one five. Let me roll six more times. There's two more rolls. Two more rolls. Two more rolls. I've rolled 12 times. I only have one five. Is anyone surprised? I'm not really surprised yet. Let me roll six more times. No fives, no fives, no fives. I've rolled 18 times and only one five. Three. No fives, no fives. See, it's interesting because when I say large, I'm not talking 24 rolls. I'm talking many, many, many rolls. So, anyways, most of the uh, problems that you work on for this weekend will involve this format.
and we'll work more on probability when I see you again on Monday. Okay? I guess I rolled a seven, and so I could do the same thing that we're doing here on the on the board is you know start tallying up the data, right? Well, I could pass the dice around. I've done this in class. Pass the dice around. We all roll the dice. Those, since some of you said you know craps, do you guys know that not all numbers will come up the same when you roll two dice? Right? And one of the first things we talk about is we talk about more likely or less likely. Give me a number that is less likely to be rolled than the number seven. Why? Okay, I'm, I'm listening. Why? Right. Calvin? There's less combinations. Less combinations. Less possibilities. I'm going to stay away from the word combinations because I'm going to reserve that for later. But I know what you mean. There's less ways of rolling a four than there are a seven. You see, you know, the big warning I tried to make last time when we're talking about probability and you want to use this formula, right? It's right up here in the, this part of your notes. The formulas are only valid if all the possibilities are equally likely to occur. That's what we said, right? Well, we can't, we can't say that the number of fours is going to be the same as the number of sevens. And so I thought I'd show you, how would you compute the probability of rolling a four, let's say, on the sum of two dice? Or the probability of rolling a seven? These probabilities are extremely important. For those of you that do play craps, you know that when you bet on some numbers, it's higher payout if it comes up than if you bet on other numbers. But those numbers are less likely to occur. And let's see why. Now. Here's the idea. Suppose I roll two fair dice. Okay? When I say fair, what do I mean? I mean each number from one to six is equally likely to come up, or to occur, let's say, right? So what I want to do now is I want to list all the possibilities, right? I could ask you, you know, here are the possible sums, and here's the probability of y equaling that sum. So I can make a little chart. The sums that we could get, I guess the lowest number would be what? Two. Two. Snake eyes, right? We call that snake eyes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Twelve would be the highest, right? Now the probability of these things coming up, that's what I want to show you how to compute. It's not as simple as, you know, it's not, it's not one out of 12, or one out of 11, or anything like that. These are not equally likely to occur. Do you guys know which one is most likely to occur, by the way? Which one? Six and eight? Now we'll see. Seven? We'll see. So here's the idea. The way to do this, I, I like to represent these things as ordered pairs. Because actually, you'll notice the dice. Oh, maybe you can't tell from the picture. Maybe if I put them both on six, you could tell. Can you tell that one is slightly darker than the other? But in real life, when you play at the you know, casino or something, they're not going to have that, right? This is just me getting... What's that? I don't know that you know it's rigged. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did not cook the dye. But I will say this, the dice are different. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little chart. From actually cooking it, huh? That's fantastic. See, I learn more each day. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little chart. And, okay, we're going to call this one the cooked die, which I never knew I had a cooked die. And this one is going to be the regular one. And what I'll do is I'll just list all the possibilities, right? So one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? And then one, two, three, four, five, or six. So what's interesting here is when I said I rolled a seven, right? It was like this. The cooked die, the, the darker one was a one, and the regular die was a six. And so one way to represent that, I guess, is I could say, you know, I'm in row six, column one. So that ordered pair, six, one, represents rolling a seven this way. Now there's other ways to roll a seven, right? Sure. Let me roll again. Oh, that wasn't a seven, though. I got a three and a five. The cooked die is a five. The regular die is a three. So that would represent this one, three comma five. Right? Three comma five. And actually, if you were to fill in the chart with all the possible ordered pairs, I claim that each of these ordered pairs would be equally likely to occur, right? How big is my sample space then if I'm going to represent them this way? Yes, 36, right? We have a grid that's 6 by 6, 36. Okay. So I want to do a computation here. I'd like to know, well, so for example, you can now tell me the probability of rolling a 2, right? The only way of rolling a 2 is if you get both dice to be 1s, right? They call that snake eyes. So using our probability formula, what's the probability? It's funny that I, see this, this y? I haven't mentioned that, but I think I will. y is what is sometimes called a random variable random variable okay and when I say here y is the sum what's the probability of y equaling 2 a way to write that would be probability that y equals 2 is that large enough Amy zoom in a little okay I saw a couple squints going on how's that so the probability that y equals 2 is equal to what? Use your formula. That's right. That's what we learned last time, right? And from your homework. There's one way out of all 36 possibilities to roll it to. You guys with me? Let's do the probability of rolling a 4. How could I roll a 4? Might be 2, 2. Here, I'll do this one in uh, blue. Might be two and two, one, three. It's interesting, because it could be the, the, the regular die is a one, and then the cooked die is a three. But do you see that it's actually more likely than that? It could be like this, one and three, but you could also get a three and a one, right? So how many ways are there to do it? Here's one. But I could also get 3 and a 1, and that would do the same thing. Does that make sense to people? So what's the probability that y equals 4? What would it be? 3 out of 36, that's right. Am I allowed to simplify that? Sure. If you want to write 1 out of 12, it's 1 out of 12. If you want to use a decimal, that's fine also. 
right? But you start getting the percentages or the probabilities of each of these to occur. From the chart, can you tell me what the most likely thing to roll is? I don't know. Seven? Okay. I'd like to pause and let you guys talk amongst yourself and see if you can compute the probability of rolling a seven. Talk to each other for just a few minutes. Let me, li let me list on the chart where all these possibilities are, right? Where are they? You can roll a six and a one, or what else? What else could I roll besides a six and a one? Three and four, so that'd be row three, column four, be right here, three, four. What's that? Two and five. What else, anything else? See, not only could I roll three and four, I could also roll four and three. Do you see that it's going to be all these along the diagonal here? Five and two. This would be one and six. So how many possibilities are there? Yeah, six. So we could say, Calvin, probability that Y, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm starting to do here. I was distracted. I won't name the name again. Probability Y equals seven would equal what? Well, yeah, and I remember my father, who loved games and loved mathematics, explaining this to me. He didn't do it this way, though. He didn't say, draw, draw the grid, and 6 out of 36. But what I th always thought was really interesting is when you simplify this, what do you get? 1 out of 6. What my, what my dad did was he showed me what a die looks like. I mean, really analyze it. When you look at a die, that's a one. Do you guys know what number's on the other side? A six. There's a five. Do you know what number's on the other side? Yeah, dice are always engineered the same way. Did they have to put them on this way? No, but they put, this, they put the six numbers on this way. I guess the point is, you know, when we were rolling the die, hey, the first die is a two. Could it be that I rolled a seven? It could be, right? Could it be that I rolled a two? You already know I didn't, right? Because I would need to get a one on both dice. But I don't care what, what this is. For the other one to be a seven, it is possible, right? So my dad said, you know, when you roll two dice, you don't even have to look at the other one. If you see this one, you know what's the probability that I just rolled a seven? It's one out of six. Well, maybe that makes sense to you, I don't know. So I wanted to, you know, get that across. So from the homework, I at least want to go over the two even problems you guys worked on. And then if you want to talk about some of the odds, we can also. So 22 to 24, were those, did they have to do the chapter problem? Was that it? I can't, I think so. Yeah, where we're going to, right. And so this, it says, refer to the sample data in table 4.1 included in the chapter problem. Assume that the subjects included in table form one is randomly selected. All right, so I want to talk about that. The word random, that's the second time we've used it. We talked about a random variable, and here it says randomly selected. So let me go ahead and, you know, go back to the notebook for a second here. And let me just give you this definition. When we say randomly selected, when we say that, I guess the word here I'm really getting at is what does the word random mean? Randomly selected means all possibilities are 
were equally likely, this is again the huge idea, equally likely to be selected. Right? All possibilities were equally likely to be selected. So it's not like picking some number between 2 and 12 by rolling dice. That doesn't count. It has to be everything was equally likely. And so what we're looking at here, the, the ch they say go back to the chapter opener, which I guess, oh yeah, it was page 133, right? Did you guys see this chart? Right? So this problem, they're talking about drug screening. And so it says you may have a positive test result or you may have a negative test result. And it's also true that maybe the subject uses drugs or maybe the subject is not a, a drug user. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of reproduce that chart for us so that we can look at it. So let's see. The numbers here are 44, and then we had a, a 90, and then we only had a 6 here, but the biggest number was 860. And I should probably label these so that we can see what's going on. So again, this is, you know, I'll put a plus for a positive test result, and this is a negative test result, right? So this is the drug screening test. And then also though, we're talking about two different kinds of individuals, right? Here, there are some that the subject uses drugs And here, the subject does not use drugs. OK. So you know, when you're going to do, this is sometimes called a two-way table. The book will call this a two-way table. And when you're going to do some calculating here, I think it's helpful to actually add some things together, right? So I could ask you, how many people in this study do not use drugs. 950, right? You could add those up and you could say, well, 950 of them do not use drugs. Right? You could add the columns also. You could say, how many had a how many had a positive test? Well, 134. But isn't it true that most of the people that had a positive test actually don't use drugs? Right? We call that a false positive, according to this example. Okay. So yeah, I mean, people do drug screenings. I, I remember having this um, certain jobs I had over my life. Right. Some places require a drug screen. Right when you get there, and and the question is, you know, just because you screen one way or does that does that prove? Well, no. There's false positives, and and there's also what are called false negatives. Right. So how many of the people tested had a false negative? Six. Right? What does that mean? There's six people that do use drugs, but they were not caught. Right? Out of how many? Well, out of a lot. Right? I mean, we have... Oh, out of how many? 50. There were 50 that use drugs. There are 950 that don't. So this is a study where N here equals what? 1,000. And you'll notice... One of the reasons it's called a two-way table is if you added these together, you, you also get 1,000, right? 134 plus 866. Anyways, I think with this information, if you go ahead and fill those pieces in, I think now we're able to probably answer the questions. So let's take a look at the, the two evens. Number 22 said, find the probability of selecting someone who got a result that is a false positive. Who would suffer from a false positive result and why? So a false positive, right? Number 22, where are we looking at? Which number are we looking at in the chart? I guess 
That's this, right? Okay. So if I asked you for uh, number 22, what is the probability of a false positive, you would say it equals what? 90 out of 1,000. Oh, that's a real easy number, right? So what percent is that? Yeah, because it's 9 out of 100, right? So you could say it's 0 0.09 or 9%, right? So 9% of the time that we administer this drug test, there's a false positive. So the question is, who suffers and why? What do you guys say for this? I mean, the answers aren't in the back. The person who had a false positive? Yeah. They might get turned away, right? Amy? Okay. Actually, who misses out? The employee or the employer? Or both, right? I mean, it depends how you look at it. So what should an employer do? Sometimes if you get a positive test, you might administer again. Right? Because, well, well, we'll see that in a little bit. But if you administer again, there still may be a, little, a, a real low percent chance of a false positive. If you got two positive tests, you might start to say, hmm. Right. How about 24? 24 asked, find the probability of selecting someone who uses drugs. Is the result close to the probability of 0.134 for a positive test result? How did they get 0.134? Oh, yeah, you could see it, right? What was that? 23 was that? Yeah, so 23 had you compute that. That's what you needed to do. So now 24 says, find the probability that someone uses drugs. What would that be? What number do I want to look at in the study here? Probability that the subject uses drugs? Yep. You can see that it's 50 out of 1,000, or in other words, 5%. So there's a 13.4% chance of the test saying that the person uses drugs, but only a 5% chance that the subject uses drugs. This is where, yeah, you may want to look for another test, or you may administer the test more than once. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on here. Okay. Any questions or comments on the, on the problem? Do you guys understand how to handle a two-way table? These, the, where these sums are really going to help you out? Okay. And you could do that on the computer as well for, for numbers that are a little worse. But this, this is a nice example, I think. What about other homework questions? Was there anything else you guys wanted me to talk about? You said, I hope he goes over that in class. Yep. Number five. It's like Number five? Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see what it said. Oh, I missed it. It was on this page. Oh, yeah. Identifying probability values. Which of the following are... Oh, I like it. Which of the following are not probabilities? So, so, Dylan, what were you thinking? Or? It's all like ones that are over 100% negative. Yeah, I mean, you can't have a negative probability, right? So we could rule out negative 0.9, right? No, that's not a probability. Actually, the one before it there. Why can't that be a probability? Seven out of three? It's greater than one, right? Greater than 100%. That's what you were talking about. That makes sense. Even this, right? Five to two ratio? No, no, no. Actually, you'll see this, though. I don't know if any of you are interested in, in, you know, when they talk about gambling, sometimes they talk about the odds. And you'll see five to two odds. That means if you bet five, you might win seven because the probability is five out of seven. But, but no, that's not a probability. That might be odds. 
oh, are you allowed to have a probability? So this one's good, this one's not. Are you allowed to have a probability of zero? You can, right? What's that mean? It's impossible. And then are you allowed to have a probability of one? That's if something is certain. Okay, that would be probability one. Okay, anything else? Yep, Jamie? 29. 29. Who says that? Well, I guess it depends what we're talking about, right? If I go to church, I'm going to hear all things are possible with God. Right? This is this question is beyond my expertise. Let's put it that way. Is there anything that I could say with probability of one? I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave that. That's a tough question. But we were, the question was about, oh yeah, the birthday problem. This is classic, classic problem. So, Jamie, what's your question about it? There's four parts. Okay, let me start with part A. What is the probability that Mike will guess correctly? Well, I guess what we need is we need to understand that... Um, we don't have any information. It doesn't say Mike has any information about Kelly. I mean, did he look her up and stalk her for 10 weeks? Or No, no, no. We're going to say he has no idea what the birthday is. Right? Yeah? All right, can we assume that we already know that like, certain ones are more likely to have a birthday, such as August, September, than, let's say, summer days? Is that true? Yes. August, September, It is true. It is true in real life. Isn't this real life? Right. If if all the birthdays are equally likely to occur, there are how many days in the year? 365. And so I'm going to guess, if you look in the back of the book, did they say that the answer to part A was 1 out of 365? They did? Okay. So yes. On the other hand... Yes, it's a fact that if you go to the hospitals, go to the OBGYN clinic, in the fall, busy season, August, September, October, most popular birthdays in the United States. At least up north. I guess people have nothing else to do in the winter around the holidays, right? No, there's, there's truth to this. There's truth to this. And I look at my kids. They were born August, September. I have October birthday. But I, I don't think that's what this is going after. I think this is going after 1 out of 365. B, would it be unlikely for him to guess correctly on his first try? Yes. Part C, this is important to understand. If you ever watch the movie Hitch, you guys see that? This just reminds me of it. If you were Kelly and Mike did guess correctly on his first try, would you believe his claim that he made a lucky guess? Or would you think that he already knew when you were born? Okay. Believe it or not, part C is an extremely important question. Based on the data, I would think that he knew. You would think he knew? Why? Because there's a 1 out of 365 chance that... Yeah. So his chances of guessing right were only what percent? Let's get a percent, right? Because, I, I mean, I'm just better with percents than fractions and turn. Oh, so what was the chances of him getting it right? Less than 1%, right? 0 0.002, we're talking, well, 0.0027. Significantly less than 1%, less than half of a percent chance and he guesses it right on the first try, what's Kelly going to think? Stalker. No, I mean, Kelly might be suspicious, and I want you to understand something. We are going to be suspicious also. You guys, if I roll the dice, 
and I get, you can't see it, I'm sorry, it's off the screen. There, I rolled snake eyes, right? Would you be surprised? Yeah. Let me roll them again. I'm sorry, you can't see it. Let me put it on the screen. Ah, I rolled it again. Would you be surprised? Here, let me roll it again. What would you start to suspect after I rolled it three times in a row? I've been cooking the dice. That's the point of this problem. Not this one. Where is it at? This one. The point of the problem is if you see something very unlikely to occur, sometimes we're going to say, wait a minute. Maybe my original assumption was false. Yeah, part D is just for fun. That has nothing to do with any mathematics. But part C has everything to do with mathematics. You guys, it's going to happen. I told you guys, real statistics is beginning around chapter 7. And in chapter 7 and chapter 8, we're going to be testing assumptions. And if we get something that's really unlikely to occur, and it happens, we might say, wait a minute. I don't think, I don't, I, I, I don't think you randomly guessed my birthday. I think you're stalking me. This is a very important idea that the book is communicating here. So I'm glad you asked that question. It's good to have on the, on the video for, for people that weren't here today, for instance. Okay. All right. What's called the addition rule for, for probability? So, here, a little bit too close now. Zoom out a little bit. So this is section 4.3, and it's called the addition rule. And section 4.3 and section 4.4 have to do with when you're talking about more than one event occurring. Okay, So the rule is this, it's for when you want to find the probability of A or B occurring. The probability of A or B. And the rule is that the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A, you can probably guess what I'm about to write, plus what? The probability of B, unfortunately, life is not that simple. I wish that were the rule, but there's more to it. You need to subtract something as well. You need to subtract the probability of A and B occurring. And I'm going to see if I can help you make sense of that. Matter of fact, I think I'd like to go to that example we were just looking at with the drug testing. You know? Let me try and use the formula. So let's, let's suppose we want to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to let D, let's let, let this represent, so how about I write it this way? Let D be the event that the tested subject uses drugs. I'm pretty sure on the homework you guys computed for me the probability of D, right? Uh, we should look at that chart again, that'll help. Here, if I want the probability of D, here's the table. Uh, so let's see, what would be the probability that the subject uses drugs? A 5%. We did that already. So the probability of D is 5%. Okay. 
Now I could do this. I could say, let um, C be the event that the test gives a positive result. I don't know if we computed that yet, so let me go ahead and compute the probability of C occurring. Uh, where would I be looking? Oh, yeah. Oh, we did that in problem 23. The probability of C occurring, that was 134 out of 1,000, so wasn't it 0.134? You guys with me? So what I might want to do now is I might want to compute. The addition rule is used when you want to compute the probability of, let's say, C or D. Or is the key word here. That signifies additional. So what happens? It's the probability of C plus the probability of D, but then you need to subtract the probability of C and D occurring. I'm sorry, this should be capital. There are events. So let's write out what that is. Right. Well, what's the probability of C occurring? It's 0.134. What's the probability of D occurring? It's 0.05. But we also need to subtract the pro what does this mean? The probability of C and D occurring. What would that what would that mean to us? Yeah. So two things happen. What has to happen? They test positive and they use drugs. Where is that in the chart? 44 out of 1,000, right? And so what we need to do to get the correct answer here is we need to subtract, I guess it would be 0 0.044. And that will get me the right answer. Okay? And so I think you get, I have to work it out, but I think you get 14%. Is that right? Let's see. 0.139, so yeah, it would be, no, it would be 0 0.09. So there's, there's a 9% chance, we could say. Here, let me just make sure I have that right on the calculator, guys. Can't hurt to double check. We have the technology. Let's use it. So what are we doing? We're doing 0 0.134 plus... Uh, 0.05, but we have to subtract what? 0.09. No. Subtract. Ah, I had it. 0.134 plus 0.05, but now minus 0.044. And so I'm getting, oh, yeah, I didn't add right. 14%. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I double checked. Oh, right, because it was 18.5 under that, so. 0.14 would be the, uh, the probability, 14%. Why do I need to do this extra subtracting? One of the nicest ways to explain it is what's called a Venn diagram. You guys know what that is? You guys know what the MasterCard logo looks like? To me, that's the Venn diagram, right? So here's the deal. If this blue circle represents event C, and if this green circle represents event C, D, let's say. When you count up C and D, 
there's a problem. If you add the probabilities of C and the probability of D, the problem is that you counted this twice. So that's why we need to subtract off, this is what is C and D. It's also called the intersection of the two sets. But you need to subtract that probability. So I guess looking at the chart that we had, you know, if I want to compute the probability of C or D, I have 134 that were positive drug tests. I have 50 that are actual users. But if I just use those numbers, I double counted these 44, right? So that's why we subtract that off. Does that make sense? No? Let me put it this way. How many people here in this study use drugs? Well, 50, right? There's 44 of them that test positive and six that test negative, that's 50. You guys with me? How many of them got a positive drug test? How many of the thousand? Well, 134, 90 of them do not use drugs and 44 of them do use drugs, right? So here's the problem. If you start adding 134 and the 50, you're going to think the answer, that's where these came from, is 0.184, but that would be wrong. Why is it wrong? Because then we counted the 44 twice, once in this row and once in that column. So we have to subtract it off to get the right answer. And if you follow that, then you understand the addition rule as written up above with A's and B's, or you could write it with C's and D's, whatever. But that's the addition one. Again, the key word is if you're in what kind of a situation? Or. An or situation tells you you're going to have the addition one. Now, I want to give you a little bit of information about the multiplication rule. Let's look at that. And then tomorrow when we come to class, I have a group work plan for you guys where we're going to be working on both of these ideas uh, significantly. Okay, so here we go. Section 4.4, okay, this is the multiplication rule. And so this section talks about how to compute the probability of A and B occur. The probability of A and B occur. So, Here I go. It equals the probability of A. You could probably guess what I'm about to write next. Times, because it's called the multiplication rule. And you know what I wish I could write? I wish I could write the probability of B. That's not quite true, almost. What is true is that we can write the probability of B, and this is how you write it. You put a bar, a vertical bar, and the way you read that symbol, this means, this symbol here means the probability of B given that A occurred. So let me see if I can come up with an easy example for you. How about this? I have 
four coins in my pocket. Four coins in my pocket. What are they? They are um, a quarter, dime, nickel, and penny. So let me say this. I randomly select one coin from my pocket. Okay? So I could ask you, what's the probability of selecting which one do you want? Let's say the dime. What would you say? One out of four. Why? Well, when it says random, what does that mean again? Everything is equally likely. Now you could argue, hey Paul, the dime's the smallest one, right? But no, 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 we're saying they're equally likely to occur. And if that's true, then one out of four. Okay. Now, you know, maybe I should have done this. I should have said D is the event selecting the dime. How about this? Q is going to be the probability of selecting a quarter. Okay. Selecting a quarter. So what would be the probability of Q? Well, it's also one out of four, right? It's just as likely as the dime because we said the word is random. But now, what if I said, what is the probability of first selecting a dime then selecting a quarter from the remaining coins? So here's where things are a little bit different, right? And that's the idea that the, we're trying to get across here. The probability of B given that A already occurred, okay? When I say selecting a quarter from the remaining coins, right? This is where I'm, what I'm writing is probability of Q and I put that symbol, given that D already occurred. That's what we mean. And what would that be? The probability of Q given that D already occurred? One out of three. Because there's only three coins left. Does that make sense to you guys? So this symbol that we have to use with the multiplication rule is saying you need, you need to take into account what already happened when you use the multiplication rule. Okay? And we'll have uh, some more ex examples of that uh, tomorrow, actually. 
I think I want to pause because I want to go to the um, back to the experiments we were doing. We did experiment on the board over here. And I'd like to go to um, those of you that have the ebook have something called Stat Crunch, and it has a really nice simulation uh, for die rolling that I'd like to show you guys and share with you. I think this would be maybe a good way to finish up here in the last few minutes of class. We'll come back to these rules tomorrow. So uh, let me go to Stat Crunch, and that's right here, maybe. Well, no, I got to go back to the uh, the website. StatCrunch. StatCrunch is a lot like Excel. Not everyone has it, so guys, I guess we're just going to do a little watching. You may have to take some notes. I'm not sure. So let me go to the StatCrunch website. Oh, but you do have on Excel, you guys have uh, some of this data, right? Was anyone able to compute the mean or something like that? Um, that's not what I want. I just want stat crunch running. Thought I had it. Here we go. Okay, that's good, but what I really want, when you load stat crunch, again, these are all the different data that came with the book. But I'm going to click on this applet, and here I have uh, simulations, and you'll notice we have coin flipping, dice rolling, etc. Let's do some dice rolling. Okay. So it says simulate a sum of dice. Number of sides on dice, six. You can change that, right? We know there's dice that are different shapes. Number of dice to roll. Uh, let's just roll one for now. Tally the roll results. Okay. Let me compute. And so, it says how many times do you want to roll the die? Well, let me roll one. Hey, I got a three. And so it shows me a three. Let me roll again. Ah, I rolled a four. So this, this can roll dice. Right now, this is no faster, right? But I could do five rolls very quickly, and it doesn't have to show me every time. It'll just drop them on for me. Right? And I mentioned last time this thing called the law of large numbers. Do you guys remember what that says? It's in our notes. Let me pose, pose, pull it back up. Similar to what? It says, yeah, they will approach the classical probability. Now, my question is, guys, what's the probability of rolling a five? We did that with one die. We said it was one out of six, right? That's because when you roll one die, all the results are equally likely to occur. Actually, look. If you just looked at this data, see how we rolled a five twice? I would say, oh, okay. So maybe that happened more often. But notice what you could do here. You could do a thousand runs. That's a lot faster than us passing the cup around in the, in the classroom, right? And so you can say from this, hey, what's, what's the uh, probability that the sum is greater than or equal to 3.5? And that's this in red here. It says 49% of the time it was greater than 3.5. I can change this. I can ask, what's the probability that the sum equals 5? And it says 0.16. Is that a pretty good approximation to what the answer should be? What should the answer be? Well, we can come here, right? 
we could say, what should the answer be? The answer should be one out of six. This is what classical probability predicts. 0.166, right? What the law of large numbers says is this. If you repeat the experiment many times, here, let me do another thousand runs. This number is going to get closer to 0.166. Let me run another thousand. You guys see that? Okay, let's get rid of that and try two dice. So I think this is important to see. So again, I'm going to do another simulation of die rolling. The difference is, this time I'd like to roll two dice. By the way, what was the most likely number to occur when we did two dice? We computed it. Seven. Seven. Least likely? Two. two. Or twelve, right? So let's compute this. Now again, if you just roll it five times, okay, we rolled a, oh, we rolled a couple of fours and an eight and a 10 and an 11. I'm gonna do another five. By the way, I just got introduced to this new game. Have any of you played it called uh, Catan? The Island of Catan or something like that? No? It's a, it's, a, it's a board game that's real popular and I was really, disappointed because I needed eights to be rolled and they weren't rolling eights, right? Kind of like here, we're not rolling sixes it looks like. But if we do a thousand die rolls, well, now it's a little different, right? Hey, remember we computed the probability of rolling a seven? Let me make this an equal. What's the probability of rolling a seven? Again, it should be one out of six. Are we getting close? We're getting close now. Right? Let me do another thousand. We're getting even closer. Should be at 0.166. Sometimes it's a little above 0.166, sometimes it's a little below. But if you keep doing thousands and thousands of die rolls, you're going to get closer to what is predicted by classical probability. And by the way, you guys know the word for this, right? What distribution are we starting to approach when we do a sum of two dice? the normal distribution. Classical probability would predict that that would happen. That's chapter five. I don't know how much of that will do. But I thought that this might be good for you to see. So I guess we didn't get that far with the, uh, the thumbtacks, right? Did we get far enough to convince you that these numbers that could come up are not all equally likely to occur? Did we get far enough for you to be convinced that there's a difference between the thumbtack problem and the die roll problem? What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you have more, though, the way we did it here. Like, I could ask how many thumbtacks came up, right? But I see what you're saying, because when you do a thumbtack, it's either up or down. Let me ask you guys this. Do you think flipping a thumbtack is equally likely to be up or down? Looking at our data, is it more likely to be up or down? Looking at our data. It seems like it's more likely to be up, because we had six people that had six of them up. Can you give me a reason why that might be true? Weight, weight of, the, of the surface, right? If it's just on the edge, right? I mean, and this is what's usually done in statistics. We look at data to base our reasoning, you know? So I kind of like that experiment as well. Hey, it was a quiet day today. Tomorrow's a little different. Tomorrow you come in, you're getting to work on some group work. Okay? So we'll see how that all goes. Have a good day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Stop by if you want extra help. I'll be here all day.